So as we said, the 2G standard adoption process in Europe happened pretty quickly. They kind of converged on GSM and TDMA pretty fast. But in the U.S., it was a little bit of a different story, a little more complicated. So many companies in the U.S. were familiar with TDMA, and they did prefer it. But we'll look at another multiple access technology right now that was proposed. And we'll actually spend the majority of the rest of this lecture talking specifically about this technology. So in 1988, the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association, or the CTIA for short, posted a set of performance requirements that they wanted the new 2G standard to meet. And those were requirements that the 2G standard had to have over analog. One of those was a 10 times improvement over the previous analog capacity. So whatever digital standard came out, it needed to have a 10 times improvement. So as we said, most companies were familiar with TDMA, but one in particular named Qualcomm had a different idea. And that idea spawned from their work in satellite communications and they used this other type of technology. What they said is, when we have our typical frequency and time, rather than trying to fit a lot of people in this same diagram or the same space, either add more people in time or add more frequencies, let's try to add another dimension to this diagram. And then we'll separate users along that dimension instead. So everyone can talk on all the frequencies and at the same time, but we will separate them over a different dimension. So you're probably saying, well, that's kind of weird because what other dimensions are there that we haven't looked at? Well, it comes back to our initial analogy where we pointed out the idea of language, as we will see in a minute. Consider two transmitters and two receivers. And this phone is trying to talk to this phone, and this phone is trying to talk to this phone. So if they're transmitting at the same time and the frequency, same frequency, we need another way to distinguish between them. So what if there's a way that we can, figuratively speaking, lock each of these links? So on this link has a lock, and the only receiver that has the key is this one. And on this link, we also have a lock, and the only receiver that has the key is this receiver right here. So that the idea is that even when this transmitter is sending and some of its power gets coupled into this receiver, that this receiver doesn't have the key that's necessary because it would need this key, but it has this key, and that only will unlock this lock specifically. So we call these different codes, and that's how we distinguish in what's called code division multiple axis. So our third multiple axis technology is code division, or CDMA. And so each of these sessions, or each of these links, if we have Anna talking, Ben, Charlie, and Dana, each of their links are going to have a separate code. So now let's see a little bit about how codes work and what exactly they mean. So suppose we have a data signal that just looks like this, just a one and then a minus one. And that's really a zero, but we look at it as a minus one just to make it more mathematically convenient. So now we need what's called a spreading code, okay, which is designed by the engineers, a spreading code that's going to scramble this message and it's gonna scramble this data signal. So if you've ever heard of the process of encryption, that's similar to this and what this is doing. It Basically, then we multiply the data signal by the spreading code, and we do that bit by bit. And the spreading code, as you can see, changes much faster than the data signal. So the spreading code is at a much higher frequency than the data signal is. And what happens then is that it spreads the data signal spectrum in the frequency domain. This signal then is going to take up a much larger range of frequencies. So that's why it's called a spreading code. So when we multiply these out, let's just think about what we get. Well, the first one, this is just one times one, which is going to give us a one. And then we have one times one again, which is gonna give us one. Then we have one times negative one, which will give us negative one. And then one times one again, which gives us one. Then we have then we have the negative one. So basically on the first end right here, we're just going to get the spreading code back. So basically we're just gonna be transmitting the spreading code because this data signal is a one and one times anything is just whatever the other number is. Now for the negative one, then we have to multiply the data signal by each of these. So we have negative one times negative one gives us one. It's gonna basically invert the spreading code on this side. So one, one, minus one, minus one. And then this is what we actually transmit. We transmit the multiplication of the data signal and the spreading code. 
then the receiver has a, a form of the spreading code that they will invert and then use to recover the original data signal and transmit it and translate it back down to its original form before it was spread out. So this may seem easy in that you just give each receiver a separate spreading code and it should work out. But it turns out that designing spreading codes is actually a very complicated process because the spreading codes have to have a property which is called being orthogonal. Orthogonal really means that they will cancel out. And so the idea is that if this receiver over here wants is trying to receive this message, that even when this person's message is going to come in, that while his spreading code will be exactly the same as this transmitter's, which is what it needs in order to recover it, the spreading code of this link and the spreading code of this link will cancel each other out so that when he applies his spreading code to this signal, it will cancel out and basically give him nothing. So he won't be able to recover any signal. And that's exactly what you want. That's that self-canceling property of the orthogonal spreading codes, as we would say. So designing spreading codes that have this property of being orthogonal is not an easy task. And that's what's really complicated about the idea of CDMA. So now you're probably wondering, well, why do we even bother using CDMA to begin with? And what did Qualcomm find so attractive about it? It's just some complicated thing that maybe doesn't give us much improvement. Well, it turns out that it actually does give many advantages. The first is that the frequency reuse factor is now one. So you remember the frequency reuse factor is the number of bands that we have to use? Well, now everyone's transmitting on every single frequency, so we have no division there anymore, which makes that factor just one. So the frequency reuse is going to be equal to one. Clearly that's desirable because that's spectrally efficient in terms of the frequency sense. But the other thing that they found really, really enticing is that it was expected to have like a 40 times improvement over the existing analog capacity. So greater than four times that 10 times improvement that they that the CTIA was asking for for the next 2G standard. At least in their initial simulations, it came out to be 40 times. What was actually realized was not anywhere near as high as that, but still 40 times is very, very enticing. So despite Qualcomm's claims, most engineers at this time resisted the idea of code-based wireless. First of all, it was a radical shift from the more intuitive TDMA type. But secondly, Qualcomm really hadn't had a demonstration of CDMA on a large scale yet one that would have shown this 40 times improvement. And so in 1989, the CTIA voted and approved TDMA as the first 2G digital standard in the United States. But CDMA did have its share of problems, and we'll look at those problems which had to be overcome before it did become a cellular standard.